We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine. That's my dad, Paul. We are back for another non-Emily episode. Um, and this was this is a big one because the British Grand Prix was pretty wild. Hi, Catherine. Yes, I thought this was the best race since Canada so far this season. Yes, definitely, definitely up there uh, with Montreal. Um, and this was this was a little bit of an adventure for me because today is also Color Wars um, mm. here at camp. So I've been running around like a headless chicken um, with my camera in hand. Oh, that's that is my cat niece Luna, um, who is chattering yes. in the background. An unexpected, yes, having, yes. an yes, unexpected is, vocalization. Yes. Well, there's something else coming, but that's okay. So we have Luna ye- yelling. Um, we also might have children yelling in a few minutes once they come out of rest hour for the second half of the day's activities. Um, and that is our current rundown of noises you'll probably hear in the background of this podcast because it is the summer and I am uh, running this podcast from a summer camp. Um but also, I want to give credit to friend of the show and former and fellow Formula One fan Sarah, who is here running Color Wars, and she is running it, you know, flawlessly. And it has made my life much easier because I will tell you that Color Wars is not my favorite day of the session by far at all ever. Oh, oh I, 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 I'm right there with you. Yeah. yeah so anyway. Fun. The first thing that we definitely need to get into, which as I predicted, I've been actually pretty decent on predictions this week. Um, I predicted that our episode, our predictions episode on Thursday would come out just around the same time that Haas announced Ollie Behrman signing for 2025. And guess what he did? Ollie Behrman signed with Haas for 2025. Yep. It happened. Um, and I mean, this this comes to, to really no surprise. It, we were just kind of waiting for it to be official. And it's nice that it happened during, um, all, you know, Behrman's home race weekend. Yeah, I think that's absolutely, you know, the timing was absolutely right. Um, Haas was uh, in the points again and yep. has done very well so far this season, uh, improving their points collection uh, this season over last. So, you know, things are looking like they're rolling uh, Haas's way. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's great to see, you know, it's great to see a rookie come on to, to the field who has, you know, the amount of potential that, that Behrman does that. And that's not to say that, you know, Logan Sargent doesn't have a lot of, you know, didn't have a lot of potential coming onto the formula one grid, you know, cause if, you know, if he didn't, Williams wouldn't have gone after him. Um, but I, you know, we've seen what, you know, Behrman can do in a Ferrari. Obviously the Haas car is I mean, at this point, you can debate whether the Haas is better, you know, that much better or that much worse than the Ferraris, considering what happened to Leclerc today. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, But, you know, there's a lot of potential for Behrman. And I think that Haas has learned a lot about how to and how not to handle rookies on their team over the last few years. I agree with that. It's also nice to see that we've got some uh, you know, some essentially some new blood and some, uh, you know, new racers that will be coming onto the grid, uh, in 2025. Um, there could be as many as three. There will probably be at least two as far as, as far as I can tell. Yeah, that's, that's also what I think. Um, and then to, you know, add on to the rumors about the second Haas seat, um, there have been a lot of rumors coming out from some I think decently reputable um, news sources that Esteban Ocon has been tied to that second seat, which could leave Kevin Magnuson SOL for, you know, A, a seat at Haas next year, and also be probably on the grid, you know, as a whole for next season. And this may be a good opportunity for Esteban Ocon because, you know, he has um, a reputation uh, as not being the best of team players, but when you mm. have a rookie who is going to need to learn the ins and outs of Formula One at this level, I think that this is a good opportunity for him to become uh, more of the mentor than just than just the competitor. 
Yeah, I mean, it could be a disaster, but it also could be a really good move for him. Um, and, you know, the the more I'm looking at it, the more I think, you know, I don't hate it. Obviously, Kevin Magnuson is, is you know, pretty popular, um, but Kevin Magnuson really hasn't been, you know, showing the same way that Nico Hulkenberg has been showing his capabilities. And obviously, Hulkenberg was able to show off his capabilities into what will become an Audi seat. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So more to come on that. We will we will see when, you know, allegedly we're going to hear about um, Akon, you know, either before the summer break or close, you know, or, or right, right by it. So that could be any time within the next three weeks. Um, and then this is something that I, I saw after today's race that I think is, is kind of interesting is um, Toto Wolf, who has been, you know, gung ho Kimi Antonelli for weeks, is now saying that Carlos Sainz is back in the mix for a Mercedes seat for 2025. And that actually is very interesting. I had not heard that. I know that Kimi Antonelli has been uh, having some challenges, shall we say, in Formula Two, and mm-hmm. has not been performing uh, up to uh, up to the standards of uh, Total Wolf and Mercedes. So, uh, you know, if that actually happens, uh, I think that still we've got you know everybody's waiting for Carlos to decide what Carlos is going to do, and once Carlos decides what Carlos is going to do then a lot of other dominoes will fall right into place. Yeah, and it could also explain why Carlos hasn't announced yet if, you know, if Mercedes is still debating on, you know, if they want to go with Carlos or if they want to go with Antonelli, that would definitely stall him for looking at, say, the second, you know, Sauber Audi seat or that second seat at Williams. Um, so it it does kind of make sense. And, you know, hopefully they decide to make that decision soon um, so that we can, you know, figure out what the rest of the grid is going to look like for next year, because, you know, we're also impatient for that. And a, and a, a signs Russell team at Mercedes could be considered to be formidable. I mean, they're definitely two very capable racers. I think personality wise, it would be a bit of a challenge, not to to the same extent as like Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg era, where, you know, we've, I've told the story about James Vowles having to come up with a document of like, this is the contract of how these drivers are going to handle each other and how the team is going to handle the drivers. Um, But I don't like, I, I think it would be a more difficult pairing for George especially with a driver of Carlos's capability to come onto the team if that does happen. I'd agree with that. And speaking of uh, uh, Nico Rosberg, uh, he did come out this morning and put his money behind Lewis Hamilton or his mouth, I should say. And for once did not curse the person that he chose or the team that he chose because for, for a very long time, you know, Nico Rosberg has been the kiss of death for predictions other than I think Max Verstappen is the only one prior to today that has been able to, that has been able to overcome the Nico Rosberg prediction curse. I agree. I agree. Maybe that curse is finally broken. We can only hope so. And we, we will find another way for Nico Rosberg to still stay related to, to F1 with that particular brand of chaos that he likes to bring. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on to particular brands of chaos, we have now the F1 movie trailer, which was originally the working title was called Apex. Um, it is now just called F1. That is the name of the movie. I don't know how I feel about that, but we have the trailer. It is out. It exists. And I think it was a little rushed. Uh, no, I think it was a lot rushed. Um, I had, there were some very interesting scenes there. Um you know, let's all remember that this is going to be a work of fiction. So some of the uh, racing that you will see is, you know, either A, not possible or B, not ever going to happen. Uh, I, you know, the demonstrative owners are are never that demonstrative, uh, but uh, it has the potential of uh, being this season's, uh, or ne- I should say 2025's, uh, you know, uh, Days of Thunder. Yeah, I I definitely think that it's going to be a good movie, um, but I do think that they rushed to get footage together um, to turn into a teaser trailer. And this is fully understanding that it it is a teaser trailer. It's not supposed to give a lot away, Um, but I I do think that they were under a lot of pressure to get something out by this weekend's race and what they gave us. You know, I'm hyped, I'm excited, but the trailer was not the best impression that it could have given us. I do agree. But uh, 
can we all say that it was wonderful to see Gunter on the pit wall for the first time in a very long time, even though yeah. it was in a fictional movie that has been approved by the FIA? Yeah, no, that that was great. It's it, it, it's great that, you know, this is not just, you know, a, a fabricated F1 team going up against a bunch of other fabricated F1 teams. Like, this is a going against Red Bull, Aston Martin, Mercedes, McLaren, like they say at the beginning of the trailer. So I do really like that. I like what we've seen of, you know, we had so many action scenes that were, were available to us. The, the car that they're using to film is an F2 car that looks like an F1 car that came from Mercedes. So it looks like we're going to get a lot as possible of like, you know, real racing type things. And it did look like a little bit, you know, like a slightly step above real, you know, wheel to wheel racing from what we've been able to see. Um, but you can definitely also tell like what was shot at a live race weekend and what was shot, you know, off season at Silverstone and after the the strike had already ended and they had to like pick things back up and scramble because the original plan was to film a bulk of those live racing bits in the latter half of the 2023 season, which obviously did not happen. Didn't happen, but you know, there's, there's things like strikes and, you know, actions, actions of other, of other unions who uh, said otherwise, but uh, yeah, it, exactly. it, it looks like it's going to be a very exciting and fun movie and I'm looking forward to seeing it. And it's just, it's going to be, um, it's going to be something. Yeah. And I think it's also going to be pretty fun to, to play, like, guess the shot that was filmed at a live race, um, because there were pictures from, from this afternoon's media pen of Lando Norris doing his media responsibilities. And then in the background, you have Brad Pitt doing his media responsibilities in quotes um, yeah. for, for the movie. So they're still filming a lot of pickups. Obviously the, the release date is a year out. Um, so there is time, but I'm, I'm really excited to see this movie. And, you know, there's, there's definitely going to be some Easter eggs, some games, some, I think there's going to be a lot of opinions surrounding this movie. And I also think that what's most important, and I'll say this a ton of times before the movie actually comes out, there's going to have to be a lot of suspending your disbelief and suspension of reality in order to like actually appreciate what this movie is going to bring. Hundred percent, hundred percent. But that's why they—that's why they make movies, and it's—it's. It's, I think it's going to be good for the sport. So it will be the week before Silverstone, but that means that there will be a lot of hype for the movie at Silverstone. And that's actually a good weekend because it's before the July Fourth uh, holiday in the U.S., and that will create a lot of hype going into Silverstone. Yeah, this, this is going to be an actual, you know, summer blockbuster of which we haven't really seen, um, you know, to get off track a little bit, we haven't really seen a lot of summer blockbusters lately, especially, you know, post COVID post strike. So this will this will be, you know, one of them. But to get back on track, let's talk about the historic moment of uh, Formula One in sport that happened today. Today, the British Grand Prix was one of the most entertaining races I've seen in a very long time. The amount of strategy that had to be used by the teams and by the drivers because of weather and because of tire management and those who got it right got it really right and those who got it wrong got it really wrong. Yeah, no, for for sure. And and to to speak of of the pers the, the number one person who who got it right, Lewis Hamilton has finally won a Formula One Grand Prix for the first time since Saudi Arabia 2021. Um, and this was not only was this you know Lewis winning you know for the last time at Silverstone in a Mercedes car, but this is the, his um, ninth win at Silverstone, which is a a record that the most any driver in the history of the sport has won at a single circuit, which is historic. Absolutely. I mean, the amount of uh, stats that he has being almost, uh, you know, 40 years old, uh, being the oldest Formula One driver in the 21st of the 21st century to win a race, his 12th consecutive Silverstone podium and 15 out of 17 years of his career. Unbelievable. Just, you know, you, you have to tip your hat, whether you like Lewis or not. And, and we are of the or not, yes. um, as, as is um, Sarah, who in, in the middle of breakfast was like, oh, hey, who won? And when I told her it was Lewis, she said, oh, really? Why? Um, but yes, it, it's great for him. You know, we make, the, you know, 
obviously I have, have done the Max Verstappen statistical on record book rundown many times in, in this podcast and here we're doing it for Lewis, but you know, that he has done a lot for the sport. He's been in the sport for 17 years. Um, and I think, you know, what's really funny is we make a, we make fun of Fernando Alonso all the time on this podcast for being old, but then again, so does everybody in the sport kind of, you know, make digs about the fact that he's old. Um, but he, Lewis Hamilton ahead of Fernando Alonso is the first driver in formula one to win a grand prix after his 300th start. Like nobody who's started more than 300 races has ever actually won a race. And this was Lewis's 344. That's, that's just amazing. Uh, and it, let's put it this way to, you know, you consider the athlete that is Lewis Hamilton, uh, for 300 starts in, in 17 years, that's, you know, that's a long time to keep yourself in shape, you know, and, and essentially, you know, have to have to sit in the car the way they have to sit in the car and, you know, go through, uh, you know, all the, uh, G forces that mm -hmm. are part of, you know, the turns in races, it's phenomenal. Yeah. And I mean, when you think about, you know, obviously the drivers in Formula One now are a lot younger and the drivers back in the 50s, 60s, 70s were a lot older, but they, the old, those older drivers were not putting themselves and their bodies through the same pressures that they, you know, put on modern Formula One cars. Um, mm -hmm. Like if you think of Jackie Stewart, Jackie Stewart would have a lot of, you know, trouble driving, you know, a modern Formula One car to the extent of, you know, in an actual race position. Um, yeah. And then to to also bring up one of our favorite um, chaos causers on the grid, Kimi Raikkonen, uh, uh, Lewis has eclipsed the all-time interval between first win and more recent win. Um, Kimi Raikkonen went 15 years between um, those marks. Lewis Hamilton Hamilton is now 17 years and one month. And this also puts Lewis at his 199th podium of his career. So he is about to, to be the first Formula One driver to have 200 podiums. Um, this is his 150th with Mercedes. And let's, let's give a shout out to Mercedes, who really looks like they figured things out. Finally. You, final, yes. And, and, you know, they have, uh, I mean, the... The car that they ran in 23 was, you know, absolutely horrific. And it took them a while this season to get where they have gotten to right now. So, you know, shout out to those at Mercedes who have really, really figured it out. I mean, you know, George had, you know, a very difficult time, uh, you know, was leading the race and all of a sudden wasn't leading the race. So... Mm -hmm. Those are, uh, those are the breaks in the business, but, uh, you know, kudos to them for figuring it out. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's not easy to, to be in the position that they're in and they're still not in a great position in the grand scheme of the driver's championship. They're still in P4 by a mile and there's a battle going on between, you know, Ferrari and McLaren, um, that's mm -hmm. really heating up right now, but yeah, no, they, they've, they've worked really hard. And also Lewis is, and this has now kind of become a joke amongst, uh, you know, formula one, but I did want to sneak this in here. Um, Lewis Hamilton is the first non Lando Norris or Ferrari driver of the day of the 20. 24 season, um, which really goes to show you that uh, driver of the day does not matter at all. No, because it's, well, I mean, it it's is opinion based. It is fan based. And, you know, God love the fans. Where would Formula One be without them? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and speaking of fans, the Orange Army had a little bit to smile about today because Max Verstappen, after really struggling through all of qualifying and obviously you know he had some some damage in, um, in his car on saturday but after you know a p4 start he managed to steal p2 with you know red bull kind of bouncing back with their little strategy blunder after austria or in austria um to to take you know a p2 that he probably would not have you know ultimately gotten you know had the race gone any other way and and this really i i think that this race is, you know, it really shows you how wonderful of a driver Max is because mm -hmm. he will take advantage of driver's weaknesses. Uh, I know that, you know, Lando was having trouble on the, on the lap where he was overtaken by Max. He had gone wide uh, into one of the turns, I think it was eight or nine and was, you know, Max just, you know, crawled up on him and left him in the dust and, Orlando had nowhere to go except to let him buy. Yeah, and exactly. And and to to give that point, Max did the same thing for Lando earlier on in the race 
which considering just how tough things looked between them after Austria and after Austria, you know, McLaren was complaining a lot about, you know, Max and everything. And Red Bull was like, you're not giving Max a fair shake. And there was a lot of back and forth um, until they finally decided to, you know, shake hands off, you know, you know, out, outside of, you know, in front of the media. Um, but the, you know, I was, I was a little worried that they would have that same combative clash that, you know, it would continue on from Austria, but they really, they kept it clean. You know, Max was really biding his time early on in the race. He had to, you know, struggle through some, some wet weather um, on, on slick tires before they ultimately decided to pit him for inters when it started raining initially. Um, but I thought it was a good clean race from the both of them. The McLaren is still very racy but you know i think red bull is starting to you know obviously mclaren the mercedes and the ferrari if you know ferrari is having a good day which they haven't been have caught up to red bull um but i think red bull will start eking back into figuring out how at least for max max can continue to do max things as for checo we'll talk about checo in a minute yeah well i think that you know max if i'm not mistaken max had the call on the tires and yes. Max went to Max went to Inters a lap before uh, McLaren did, so that gave him an advantage uh, over the uh, you know because of the weather that was coming through, and he was able to get out. And he you know he uh, you know the, their strategy they went on to hards for the uh, last third of the race, which I think was uh, genius because where. Uh, McLaren and Mercedes were both on softs, you know, those tires degraded rather quickly on this track. And uh, Max had, you know, had time uh, to catch up and actually, you know, get ahead of uh, Lando. Uh, and, you know, just, you know, you run out of track uh, after a while and, you know, you know, kudos to, to Lewis for, uh, uh, you know, running a good race. Yeah, no, he he ran a great race and and like Max would Max have gotten Lewis eventually especially on the tire d discrepancy sure um but you know it Max also took too long to get past Lando in that tail end of the race. So it, yep. it really, by the time Max did get past Lando, he was still like 3.3 seconds behind Lewis. Um, and that wasn't right. going to happen in like three laps, which is the same thing that I said in um, Spain when mm -hmm. Lando was on his charge, quote unquote, uh, according to some of the commentary. Um, but it, yeah. But anyway, it was, it was a good race for Max. Um, he, I, I wasn't able to, to listen into to the post-race interviews um, because I was, you know, color wars, uh, but it looked like Max was, Max was, was chill about it. Um, and uh, where conversely, I think Lando really, I think Lando had a lot higher expectations of, um, his performance over the weekend. I know that he was, you know, upset to miss out on pole and he was definitely, you know, upset to be, you know, P3. Um, but this was still a really great race for him. Lando just like, now that Lando has, you know, had a taste of winning, he really expects to be at the top step of the podium every race. And, you know, like Max, it's, it's first or bust. Yeah. And with, you know, Max is a very, at, at least, in the interviews that I've seen of him, Max is very even tempered. Mm -hmm. So he may, he may express his displeasure in the car in the moment uh, or his, or his, you know, his, his non plus pleasure in the car in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I really feel that, that Lando kind of wears his, his heart on his sleeve and, you know, is, is very, you know, is very emotional. He's, he was happy, you know, uh, you know, getting his, his second Silverstone podium, but I really think that he felt he should have done better. And, you know, yeah. they, they may have made a strategy error by going to the softs and trying to go after Lewis, as opposed to going to the mediums to defend against Max. Right, exactly. And especially when you're in a race that is interrupted by rain, which means that the tire requirements for pit stops go out the window where I believe that they could have gone back to another set of mediums after being on inters. Um, but correct. yeah, I, I really, those, those, it was, it was a gamble to go on the softs. Lewis had just enough of a lead over Lando and Max 
got those hearts to, to work and to cooperate and got lucky that the track was as dry as it was by the end of that race in order to, to make that happen for them. Um, but, you know, still Lando Nor I, I predicted the beginning of the season of a potential McLaren leapfrogging over Ferrari and week after week, we get closer and closer because McLaren is only seven points back of Ferrari for P2 in the constructors championship. It's going to happen. It's oh, definitely fully gonna happen. Yeah, because uh, as we will discuss it a little bit in a little while, somebody did a dumb. A big one. And and, and to, yeah. to also say, you know, Carlos Sainz was, you know, Carlos is keeping the team afloat right now, which is, you know, it, they, they've gone back and forth, but Ferrari just has struggled significantly against Mo since Monaco. But we'll talk about that in a second. Let's go to who else impressed. And, you know, with all of the action happening up front, I really kind of forgot about what was happening in the back, which is kind of a pleasant surprise because the last couple of years we've been so used to everything being, you know, the middle of the pack because Max is 800 seconds ahead. But Nico Hulkenberg and his Haas car have forgotten that their car's not supposed to be fast on Sundays because he had his second P6 finish in a row. But it has been. And it's really, uh, you know, kind of shaking up the uh, uh, middle of the pack. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm doing this off the top of my head. Haas now has 27 points this season versus the 12 they had last season. Um, I think you're right. Let and, us see. This is, you know, I think that Nico Hulkenberg yes. is, uh, you know, should be credited uh, along with uh, everybody else at Haas because, you know, as, as I think I heard Martin Brundle say, uh, you're talking about a team that has had, uh, you know, versus, and, and versus Ferrari, with the same, essentially the same engine, uh, you know, who has out raced and outscored point wise Ferrari, uh, you know, a lot this season, which, you know, you know, comparing the budgets of hundreds of millions of dollars to tens of millions of dollars is, you know, is phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it the budget cap has definitely helped and that's what the budget cap was for is to help teams like Haas be competitive. Um, but you still can't, you know, outscore a Ferrari in a car that isn't fast on, 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 sat on Sundays. And, you know, even if they can qualify well, but Hulkenberg has really been out driving the heck out of this car. Um, this is his hit it. Nico Hulkenberg's first top six finish in back-to-back -back races since 2018 um, at Cota and Mexico when he was back at Renault. And this is in same year, Haas's first back-to-back -back top six finish since France and Austria. Um, so it's, it's great to see them, you know, do, you know, doing what they've been doing. Obviously it's going to suck for Haas to lose Hulk next year. Um, and it's going to suck for Hulk to have to drive a Sauber next year. But, you know, soon he will be at Audi and maybe he'll finally get a podium. And yeah, that would be, uh, I think that would be phenomenal. And if I'm not mistaken, um, he's virtually caught up to Lance Stroll uh, in the uh, Drivers' Championship, uh, you know, just one point behind uh, P11 to P10. Yeah, which is kind of like, you just don't really expect that. Obviously it's great. Um, and it also kind of highlights that Aston Martin just really hasn't been all that great this year. And that said, Stroll did finish in the points and so did Fernando. Um, but you know, it's, it's still not, you know, where we expected Aston Martin to be and, you know, not where we want Aston Martin to be. Exactly. No, I agree with you. Uh, and the, you know, having Haas with back to back top top six finishes for the first time since 2018, you, know, you don't you don't realize that that Haas hasn't been on the grid for that long. And, no. And those are, you know, that that shows a real positive progression for the team as it uh, as as we move on into the season. Yeah, exactly. You know, Haas is a younger team. I think their their first year was like 2016. Um, so they are, you know, they're, they're doing much better than, you know, the, the awful days of, you know, the 2021, 22 season. So this is, this is fully much better than, you know, this is, this is where Gene Haas really wants to be, or I mean, not completely where, but it's on the, on the, you know, upward trajectory. It's on a, it's on a yeah forward moving trajectory. And, and now they've got a couple of weeks before Hungary. Uh, which also has had a reputation of being uh, weather uh, impacted. Uh, yes. So, yeah. It, so, it yeah. could be, 
it, it's it's Hungary is going to be be a tough race in two weeks, and so the you know it'll be good for the teams to have a little bit of downtime, and it'll you know be interesting to see which teams have taken advantage of that downtime. Um, yeah. But speaking of another British team, Williams actually, I will give them they had they had a good weekend this weekend. Um, Alex Avon was in the points. Logan Sargent had his best finish of the year. He is no longer last in the driver's championship. Thanks to aggregate finish, even though he and Botas both still don't have points. Um, but I, I will give it to Williams. This is one of, this has been one of their better showings. Yes. Yes. It's nice to see. And um, can we attribute it to their, uh, to their Silverstone livery? Maybe they'll want to run well. the Silverstone. Yes. I mean, they might, you know, listen, if, if I were Williams, I would run that livery uh, in Hungary. What do they got to lose? Yeah. I mean, they won't, but um, it, it, it is a great livery. It looked, it looked good on track for, for the little that we were able to see of that car. Cause obviously there were so many other things happening. Um, but yeah, you know, it was, I, I was looking at the, the results when I finally had, you know, time to, to sit at lunch today. I was like, Oh, Williams was not terrible. That's great. Um, yeah. Cause you know, we, we want to see Williams do well. And, and this is, you know, one of their, their better performances and it's great that it happened at their home race. I agree. I agree. And yeah. uh, you know, Logan Sargent, uh, who is you've been rumored now to be moving over to IndyCar mm -hmm. uh, as one of his major options uh, did have his best finish of the season so far at P11. Yeah, and, and I will say to to talk about those rumors about, you know, IndyCar, he would be, you know, re-teaming up with Prema, who I believe he he was driving with in one of the, the younger series. Um, but this is going to be Prema's entry into IndyCar. Um, and I feel like, you know, that would be a good move for them to have A, an American driver, B, have a, a driver with Formula One experience such as it is, um, and, and C, you know, con it, continuing to allow him to race in IndyCar, which... You know, there there might be a little bit more of an a pro Logan Sargent audience for for the United States to to have him in in Indy. Yeah, no, I, and I happened to watch the uh, the IndyCar race this uh, this afternoon in Ohio, and the focus is exclusively on the top three. Yes, you know, forever it is. You know, no one cares what's happening. You know, you've got you've got thirty cars, and no one cares what's happening in the middle of the pack. Uh, because it's one long, you know, for lack of a better term, DRS train that, um, you know, is is running around the track. And unless you're top two or top three, nobody cares. But in, mm -hmm. the wonderful thing about Sky's uh, reporting is that they will talk about everyone one to 20 and, you know, look for things that are going to be the most interesting for the fans, because not everybody is a fan of the the team or the driver that's up in the front. Yeah, exactly. So it's been interesting. Um, and then to yeah. move on to who disappointed, it's a little like there's a little bit of who disappointed, but a lot of what disappointed. And first things first, George yeah. Russell's water pump. Big disappointment. Big day ruiner for, for poor George Russell. Yeah, it was it was very tough. I mean, he was on the pole. He had the lead. He was, you know, working to get uh, back up when he had to move to Inters and looked like everything was going along dandily when Water Pump said, nah, nope. I have other plans. Yeah, it was it was a bummer for him because he had a really good start off the line. Um, and, you know, the, the start of the race was was very clean, um, but we really didn't expect to, you know, I, I remember I was standing out on the lawn when when I saw the, the graphic of the um, the radio call for him to retire the car. And it was like, oh, that's not good. Um, and yeah, that was that that's just really rough. And he had, you know, such high expectations on all three British drivers. Um, and then for for one of those British drivers to not finish the race and then to obviously see his teammate take that win. That's really tough on George. Agree. And if you look, go back to the start of the race, uh, you will see that, uh, you know, George took off. Uh, he had a mm -hmm. very good and it looked like Lewis, who was angled a bit into the center of the track, was covering off to make sure that he got the start that he needed so that Lando couldn't overtake Lewis to get into, P, you know, into uh, P2 um, right at the start. And also, since mm -hmm. they were all trying to make sure that Max didn't you know, create havoc, 
Um, you know, there were there were a good five or six racers who were all competing at the top uh, early on in the race. Yeah, exactly. And when you have a front row lockout, you know, your strategy is going to be very different than if you don't have that support person that's, you know, gridded behind you um, or next to you, such as, you know, such as the way the grid is made up. So it was really interesting. Um, and then, of course, one driver did not start the race at all because Pierre Gasly's uh, gearbox decided, let's not. And then on the formation lap, he had to pull into the pit lane and uh, retire the car immediately. Well, Pierre had a very bad week. They had replaced, I think, virtually everything but the driver uh, on his car and, and had a had a 50, uh, 50 position grid 50 penalty. Place. Yeah. Yeah. 50, which, which is interesting because, you know, that there's only 20 racers and, you know, to have a 50 place grid penalty, it's like, we'll just take it all and redo it. And to not be able to get out of the out of, out of the box because he actually started P nineteen uh, because uh, uh, Checo had to uh, start from uh, uh, the pit lane, um, you know, could have had some some good opportunities, but uh, uh, didn't happen. Yeah, no, it it really di didn't materialize. But what did materialize was some great memes on social media about Pierre's starting position. Um, I saw one earlier today that was, you know, the it was a Google Maps and it showed uh, the the Formula One grid. It, it showed that everyone starting in Silverstone and then Pierre starting in France. Um, <laughs> so there were there were a lot of great memes to come from that. Um, but you know, if if your if your brand new gearbox is going to take a dump while you're on the formation lap that's just that's really rough and then to you know for to add insult to injury Espen Ocon also had a p16 finish so he had a terrible day so it was it this is more indicative indicative of the alpine that we saw at the beginning of the season than really what we've seen over the last couple of weeks agreed agreed enough enough said <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. But then to move on to what we both predicted would happen is Ferrari did Ferrari themselves and Charles just, I don't know, like the Monaco curse was supposed to just be Charles not winning at Monaco, not winning at Monaco and then never seeing success again in the sport. And it's just, it's been so rough for the last, I mean, it's been almost two months yeah, it has been very difficult. I know that I, I I did see an interview with Charles who just said, "Look, I'm I'm like beyond, you know, upset right now. Um, they got his sure. tire strategy wrong. They got the weather wrong, and he could not get out of it. You know, even as as hard as he tried. Um, I think that he was as high as seventh and was competing." Uh, with Carlos for a little bit, but he just, they just never got it right. No, they, they didn't. And to, to add insult to injury, he started P11. He did not, Logan Sargent finished P11. As, as we said earlier, Leclerc finished P14. So he lost three places. The, the strategy was bad. So, and like, you can't always help, you know, having a, an issue at qualifying, but then to not be able to, you know, at least maintain your position in a Ferrari when you're passed by Kevin Magnuson in, in a Haas car and Danny Ricardo in a V carb. Now Danny does have an, a, a newer gearbox in his car, but like, that's like, they, they just did everything wrong with Charles. And I, Lewis has got to see some concerns. Um, Cause you know, obviously he, you know, Lewis can see what's happening there at his future team. And like, I'd be worried if I was Lewis Hamilton. I, I can't disagree with you. And you know, here is, you know, Lewis, they make, they make the announcement that Lewis is going to Ferrari. So now we, we know that Char uh, Charles has been anointed as the, you know, the quote unquote team leader at Ferrari, and he can't find his way out of a paper bag, you know, mm -hmm. and because you've got uh, Carlos Sainz, who has continually outraced him over the last number of weeks it just makes it look like Ferrari just made a bad, a bad business decision. Yeah, it, it's, it doesn't look great. You know, obviously we talk plenty about how underrated Carlos is as a driver. Um, but then, you know, Carlos 
is is really the the only driver right now that is saving Ferrari as a constructor from you know for their their P two position like they're they're about they could very well lose it in Hungary to McLaren if they have another weekend like this. Exactly, exactly, and weather strategy is going to play a big role in Hungary in two weeks. Sorry, that's my walkie-talkie that I forgot to turn off before we started recording. Welcome to camp. Yeah, so. AMF so, and for our last, Yes, exactly. And then for our last disappointment, Sergio Perez. Not only did he finish P17 in the Red Bull, but he finished two laps down with a brand new power unit in his car. Yes, and I, and there were signs that, uh, Checo was was actually doing rather well early on. He started from pit lane and had gotten up to P15 before things just went to crap. Yeah, and obviously they, you know, sometimes when you have, you know, the the driver discrepancies that you have where, you know, Max is up front and Perez is in back and, you know, Perez is going to play guinea pig, um, which he did play a lot of guinea pig for tire strategy. He was one of the, he was, I think, the second driver to switch to inters this morning. He was probably one of the early drivers to switch back to slicks. Um, but he, you know, he just looks really bad right now. And so there are all these rumors swirling and the same thing with last year, but now, you know, obviously now Perez has a two year contract that he just signed before he's, you know, started driving like terrible. Um, so the, the real, the, the, con the concern, you know, is, is Red Bull actually going to, you know, not tear up his contract, but find a way out of the contract that they just signed with him, especially when you have the likes of Daniel Ricardo, who's not a terrible option. And then Liam Lawson, who's waiting in the wings and will be testing um, Max's RB20 um, this week to a, probably work out some of the kinks that Red Bull still has right now, and then B, show Red Bull just how capable Liam Lawson is as a driver. Because if you remember from last season when he subbed in for Danny, Lawson's pretty good. Yep. Like, he's really good for the fact that he's stuck being a reserve driver. Yes, exactly. And I did see a rumor, and I don't know how uh, uh, substantiative this is, but uh, Checo needs to be within 100 points of Max in the driver's championship, or it gives Red Bull an out in his contract. I've seen that too. I think that that those rumors started swirling a lot last year. And I think that they were kind of debunked from the Red Bull camp of, you know, that's not a thing, but who actually knows? And, you know, with somebody as cutthroat as Helmut Marco in charge of, you know, basically in charge of who, who drives for, for which team, you know, they, they could, if if Perez doesn't figure out his his stuff because this is just like his 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 streak last year and the year before where he's been driving like crap, um, you know they and especially if Ferrari or McLaren starts cr creeping up behind Red Bull in the constructors championship any closer than they are, they'll probably tear up that contract and we'll see a different driver in that second Red Bull seat next year. I think I think you're right. I think that from a strategy perspective, starting from the pit lane on hards was an excellent idea and worked really well, but they went to inters too early. And that's where his and that's, you know, that's Checo's call. So, you know, that I, I just think he went to he went to inters too early and then couldn't get back out of them. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they couldn't double stack. So it was, you know, a real, a real problem. Yeah, it, it, it just, it, it was, it's, it's not looking good for the, the Paris side of the Red Bull garage and something's got to give and we got to figure out what, what it is that, that, you know, helps Paris turn the corner so that he can turn the goddamn corner already. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And let's move on to reliving our British Grand Prix predictions. Um, let's see. I was okay this weekend, and we did get the the non points scoring uh, predictions pr pretty well. Um, I looked at the spreadsheet and realized that it's been a while since I updated the spreadsheet. So there will be a um, points update between me and Emily going into Hungary, and I will we will see what the the actual points are because I'm really not sure because I think I'm missing a couple of races. Um, but anyway, pole position. I predicted Max. You predicted Max. Emily predicted Lando. It was George for some reason. 
Um, the podium, um, you and Emily picked a Lando Norris, Max Verstappen, George Russell podium. Obviously, George did not finish the race. Um, and I picked a Max Verstappen, Oscar Piastri, Lando Norris podium. And the podium was, of course, Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen, Lando Norris. Well, um, yes. let, let me let me ask this. Can Emily get half because she picked the right team as opposed to the right driver? No, because if I couldn't get points for getting the drivers, but not in the correct order, then Emily does also not get half points either. So sorry, Emily. I tried. Um, you tried. I tried. <laughs> Which, but here's where I tried and I was successful. I picked Yuki Sonoda at P10 and he got P10. I think this is my second correct P10, P10 prediction this season. Like I said, I have to double check and I have to update the spreadsheet. Uh, but I picked Yuki, Emily picked Fernando, who did finish in the points, and you picked Danny Ricardo. So, we're good. Yep, there you go. And then for biggest surprise, I said that Haas was going to have a double points finish. I was half right. Hulk got points in back-to-back -back races, which totally doesn't count, but I'm gi giving myself half points anyway. And then you said um, that Fernando would be back in the points, which he did, um, which this is only his second points finish in the last six rounds pre, which is kind of wild considering how Fernando has been driving. Fernando is actually, you know, doing, I think, as best he can, as, as is uh, Lance Stroll with a uh, with an Austin Martin uh, car that is has just underperformed, and the uh, the quote unquote upgrades that have been uh, uh, downgrades downgrades um, have really hampered their ability to be competitive this season. Yeah, they 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 really have been, and that's not what we want to see out of Fernando and that other guy that he drives with. Um, yeah. But anyway, going into who is going to do a dumb, we both picked Ferrari being Ferrari. Um, you specifically said Ferrari will screw up Leclerc, which was true. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like like we said earlier in the episode, Ferrari does not look good. Ferrari needs to figure out their lives and maybe, you know, pick up a book on strategy. Well, or two. either that or, um, you know, start paying their drivers more because they're they're actually driving and doing strategy at the same time when you're supposed to have engineers that are you know working on strategy and working on weather and working on you know things of that nature yeah because you know this is this is a weekend where ferrari only came away with 11 points and that's only because carlos was able to steal fastest lap in the last lap of the race yeah. um and you know, especially in this battle that's heating up with McLaren, as we have said, like they need to get that figured out and, you know, fight or not. Um, but, you know, P3 in the championship is not where Ferrari wants to see itself any more than Mc uh, Mercedes wants to see themselves in P4 at the, you know, bottom of the top of the pack. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. Yep. So um, final thoughts on Silverstone. Very exciting race. Love the, uh, uh, Love the strategy that w had to take part within the race. Uh, I think that there were uh, six drivers uh, that could have won this race at any point in time. Uh, no one is has, is really uh, ahead of the pack in any way, shape, or form that is going to essentially, you know, run away with races the way Max did last year. So he's in a fight, and I think he knows it. And uh, I think he relishes the opportunity to be in that fight. Yeah, I think that, you know, the fighting, you know, at the top is something that's really good for the sport right now. Um, and, and when you consider that, you know, before the Max Verstappen era of dominance, there was the Lewis Hamilton era of dominance. Exactly. Um, that was just like the Max Verstappen era of dominance, where it was, you know, they would be 30, 60, 90 seconds ahead. So to have everybody at the front of the pack be so close is, you know, only, you know, only good for the sport. Um, I also appreciated, you know, Lewis Hamilton's, both Lewis Hamilton's parents were at the race. And so they all got to celebrate with him. I think Lewis was sad that he wasn't able to crowd surf after the win as he has in the past, because they didn't let the Silverstone fans out to where he usually goes crowd surfing at the end of the race. Yep. Um, but, you know, it was for, you know, even not being a Lewis Hamilton fan, it was really nice to see that show of support, the, you know, the patriotism, all, all of that um, was, was, you know, it was a really cool spectacle that you don't get to see at a lot of races, but Silverstone is one of those really great historic races where you see a lot of cool things like what we got to, to experience today. 
And did you notice that Toto Wolf was very chatty after this race? And I mean, yeah. very chatty. He was talking all the way down to the podium. And that was, yes. uh, you know, all of a sudden he's Toto's back. All of a sudden, we we are seeing the Toto of the you know twenty fourteen to twenty twenty one Mercedes era of dominance, um, which is is kind of fun because you know Toto is is one of the more expressive, fun team principals on the grid, and to see him sitting frowning with Mick Schumacher standing over his shoulder is not always like the best thing that we want to see. Right. Um, but it, you know, it it was cool, it was fun. Max and and Lewis had like a little joke at each other in the the cool down room that you know that was that was some good sportsmanship there was also a lot of good sportsmanship max pulled up alongside lewis to congratulate him mm -hmm. when they were on their cool down laps um lando came up too um so and like one of the marshals ran out and gave lewis a flag as they always do when lewis yep. wins at home yep. um so it was it was it was a really nice spectacle to see and you know sure max didn't win but it was a fun race absolutely i agree with you yep so coming up next, uh, Formula One is taking the week off because the triple header has been very hard on all of us um, and are, is going to be back in Hungary at the Hungaro Ring in two weeks. Um, Emily will be back from her post-Argentinian travels, um, and we will have some sort of episode probably out sometime next week. Um, TBD on that. We might do an F101. We might do an Emily reacts to the news that, that she missed um, over the last um, little while or you will do all of the above. Um, we do need to get her thoughts on the F1 trailer and um, Ollie Behrman signing and whatever else is going to happen between now and the next race. Um, follow us on uh, going.off.track for updates on Instagram. Also, don't forget to subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, and uh, thanks for guest hosting with me, Dad. And uh, thanks for going off track with us. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.